Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 29th, 2016. I'm James Spencer. I'm Steve Wilkes. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, it's our annual disaster show. We'll be sharing tales of brewing gone bad sent in by you, our listeners. Uh, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com. We can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And don't forget our brewer's logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can find us all over the place. Uh, on Twitter, I am Basic Brewing. And Steve, on Twitter, you are? Um, I don't remember. I think you're Steve's <laughs> Brew Shop, aren't you now? Yes, that's right. I couldn't remember if it was, uh, I, yeah. I'm... <laughs> it's been a long day. Steve's Brew Shop. <laughs> and there, the uh, Facebook page for this show is uh, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Uh, thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link during this busy, busy holiday season that we just made it through. Uh, boy, there's a bunch of stuff went through that. Um, we, we, we're recording this. We're recording this episode in separate locations over Skype uh, because uh, I'm getting over a stomach bug. And I didn't want to risk giving it to Steve. And, uh, and your wife, Gretchen, is, is, I guess, going through the same thing, huh? Yeah, she is. And I, apparently I'm going through dementia. I couldn't remember the name of my company. <laughs> <clears throat> it really has been a long day. <laughs> so how are things going over at Steve's Brew Shop in Fayetteville, Arkansas? Going very well, thank you. It's uh, Things are just cooking right along with gas. <laughs> and electricity. Well, uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> Because everything's up to date in Fayetteville. That's right. <laughs> These are all jazz references, right? Yeah, well, something like that. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the disaster stories, let's talk about our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. Yep. Uh, we spent some time with Desiree and Dave recently. They came over to see your new shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went out and had some, some beers with Desiree and Dave, and they are in the process of moving to a larger location uh, not far from their current location. They're being forced to move mm -hmm. uh, because their current store is uh, will be demolished uh, before too long. And, and, and that doesn't work for a retail space, uh, being, no. being demolished. <clears throat> it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, hard to run a, it's hard to run a blue light special in the middle of a – Vogon uh, reconstruction project. <laughs> <laughs> the plans have been on file. Uh, yeah, that's right. I told him just to grab a blanket and not panic. <laughs> yeah. Grab your towel. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the but but Desiree and Dave are, they're making the best of it. Uh and the the new location is is much bigger. And uh, in, in in addition to the increased space that they've got, they're they're planning to open actual brewery in their new location. Uh, so they'll wow. be they'll be filling growlers there, and they're all, they're already a winery uh, making wine there at their current location. So they'll continue to do that, but they'll they'll open a, a new brewery with a tasting room. Uh, the uh, the bad news is that the move and expansion is going to cost money, of course. So they they've started a GoFundMe project. To help cover those uh, costs, so if you go to uh, GoFundMe.com and search for High Gravity, uh, you can see the list of cool premiums that you can get for helping Desiree and Dave uh, with the move. And uh, most of those are, are uh, for those who are local in the Tulsa area. But there is also some things like uh, uh, you know to do with wine kits and uh, beer kits and such as that, uh, and also. If you go to youtube.com slash high gravity brew, uh, you can see Desiree demonstrating the Warthog EBC 330 electric brewery controller uh, as she brews a Christmas beer. And that uh, I, I haven't seen all of that video yet. It's brand new. Uh, so go check that out at uh, youtube.com slash high gravity brew. And we thank Desiree and Dave for their support and their friendship over this past year. Go check them out and uh, give them some oven at uh, highgravitybrew.com. That's right. They're, they're really good folks. They sure are. All right. Are you ready to delve into the, the stack 
of of brewing disasters, Steve? I believe so. I believe <laughs> I am I'm primed and ready. <laughs> and you're and you speaking you speaking of primed, you you're actually drinking a beer. I'm drinking diluted Gatorade. So <laughs> well, I didn't brew it, honestly. Really. <laughs> <laughs> My cocktail of Gatorade and water. Um, you got to keep those electrolytes up. God, I hope so. Man, I feel rough, but I'm trying not to whine. <laughs> this show's well, not about wine. It's about beer. <laughs> yeah. You don't, and you're not, you don't have a winery license anyway. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's start this off with uh, Mac. Uh, and I don't know where Mac is from, but he, he says... Uh, uh, he has an upstairs apartment. Our bathtub had a very small crack that our maintenance guy said not to worry about, of course. Huh. <laughs> he says this will be shattering. <laughs> exactly. He says this will be important in a moment. Max says last summer I was only able to chill a batch to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit with a wort chiller and our tap water before the machine wash uh, the the washing machine filled up. Uh that's where I collect the hot water from the chiller. So that's smart. I decided a giant ice bath would cool the the kettle the fastest. I put the kettle in our bathtub and filled the tub with water and ice. About 10 minutes later, the tub was completely empty. I I assumed the cheapo rubber drain stopper had gotten a bad seal, so I adjusted it and refilled the tub. Another 10 minutes and the tub is empty again. I filled it a third time and went downstairs to put some brewing equipment away in our storage unit. That's when I realized where all the water went. <laughs> Three bathtubs worth of water went through the crack, through the floor, and down into the parking area beneath our bathroom, taking a large amount of drywall with it. Hey. L- <laughs> Luckily, the storage unit it flooded was only full of buckets of paint and other groundskeeping equipment. Over the next couple of days, our linoleum floors started to bubble up. We ended up getting our tub reglazed and our floor replaced, so in the end, our apartment is actually nicer than before, and the beer was fine. A happy ending. Well, that's not a brewing disaster at all. <laughs> it's a bathtub disaster. It's a landlord disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, Max sent, sent an update. He says, as I write this, a crew is removing our shower enclosure to replace it. Apparently, the company that reglazed the tub didn't do anything to reinforce the fiberglass, and it cracked again. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> He says, I, I, I keep thinking about how all this could have been avoided if I had just bought an aquarium pump and recirculated ice water through the immersion chiller. So there you go. Um, and thank goodness he's renting. That's the, that's the lesson. Yeah, for sure. This comes from uh, Gerald in Clackamas, Oregon. I'm going to say yeah. Cla- Clackamas. Uh, Gerald says... Uh, I've been hesitant to share this story because of the graphic nature of the physical injury, and uh, y- y- you're lucky you didn't you didn't see the pictures that came along with this <laughs> with this email. Uh, Gerald says a listener discretion is advised. Uh, I've been brewing for many years and have been doing all grain for about three years, mashing outside and boiling outside, carrying the boiled wort into the kitchen, and using an immersion chiller to cool to pitching temperature. My brewing assistant is a 110-pound female Shiloh Shepherd and the cause of the accident. Brewed my beer as usual. At this time, I mashed in my unmodified chest cooler, scooping out the mash into a strainer into my 8-gallon pot, boiled for 60 minutes, and went to carry into the kitchen to cool with the immersion chiller. I opened the slider door and went to enter the house with the boiled wort. My shepherd decided to charge out of the house when I tried to come in, and not to dump the wart on her, I pulled the pot back, and it sloshed all over my arms and legs. Ew. Suffered major burns on my arms and legs, being a registered nurse with 20 years of working trauma and working in a burn unit. I knew to get into the shower and, and debride. I'm afraid to ask what debride means. Uh, <laughs> after the shower, I uh, finished the beer. Now, this is the dedicated brewer part of the thing. After the shower... Intending to his severe burns, I finished the beer, (laughs) and it ended up being good. Consequently, I had to take off two weeks off work to heal. Uh, After this episode, I changed my brewing practice. I purchased a proper mash tun, a kegel, a pump, and a plate chiller. Everything done outside and safe. No more injuries and great beer. Wow. That 
that does qualify as a brewing disaster. Yes, exactly. Now, now I have to say I'm guilty of uh, of carrying hot wort, you know, up the back stairs into the house to to you know set by the back sink there to yeah. Uh, so, or you know, through the kitchen, and and I've got little dogs, so knock wood, you know, everything's okay. But uh, it, it's a cautionary tale, I would say. That's right. It's because mm-hmm. this comes from Jeff in Dallas. He says, "I hope someone can learn from this." <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do travel a lot, so my setup is a simple brew in a bag with natural gas plumbed to an outdoor burner with BCS automation so I can see my fermentation temperatures while on the road. Fancy. I I was fortunate to get stuck in Portland, Maine during the latest winter blast the United States had. This gave me an opportunity to have a Bissell Brothers Northeast IPA and a couple of sours. Mm. Uh, I did continue on my trip after two days and ended up a thousand miles away from home when the disaster started. Before going to bed, I checked my BCS. The fermenter temp was fine, but the kettle temp was below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or or 6 degrees uh, below zero Celsius. Had the pilot light gone out? I went to bed hoping it was a simple glitch, and I would take care of it at a couple days' time when I got home. At 2 a.m., I received a phone call from my wife, never a good sign, who was woken up by the gas company. She handed the phone to the gas man, and he told me the neighbors on the next street over had smelled gas and called it in. They traced it back to my back patio outdoor kitchen and the brewery that I had built a year and a half ago. I told the gas man where the shutoff valves were, and he shut them off. He then got out his sniffer. Well, (laughs) who wouldn't? Well, yeah. (laughs) And said he still detected a leak. He said that he had to shut off the gas to the house. By that time, it was 16 degrees Fahrenheit. He He handed the phone to my wife shut off the gas to the house, and was on his merry way. Uh, Before I said a word to my wife, I already concluded my brewing career was over. (laughs) (laughs) I told her there was a gas leak in the brewery. There would be no heat in the house. I offered to get her and the kids, two dogs, and the cat a hotel. She said, no. You know I was in trouble, Jeff says. Obviously, I did not sleep a wink the rest of the night trying to figure out how uh, to get this fixed in short order. I was in no shape to fly, so I called the chief pilot, I guess Jeff is a pilot, Uh and uh, told him about the situation with my house slash family, and he was very kind to take me off my trip to go solve the problem. By the time I made it home at 3 p.m. the next day, the backyard was flooded, (laughs) and there were four broken pipes under the sink spraying water all over the outdoor kitchen. I shut off the water, and the plumber showed me about an hour later or showed up about an hour later, and we went to work. The two plumbers on the gas and me on the water. They told me the protocol. They would troubleshoot the gas leak uh, and then put the system under 15 PSI pressure. And if it held for 15 minutes, they would they would call, uh, pull a permit call. The city and the inspector would come uh, to put the gas system under pressure for 10 minutes. And if it passed, the gas company would be called and the pressure test the system. And, and if it passed again, they would unlock the gas meter and it would be turned on. Did you get all that? <laughs> <laughs> um, we worked until 10 that night, and the plumber said I was going to have another cold night. See you in the morning. Oh, jeez. I offered my wife another hotel room, but she said she would tough it out. But you better have it fixed tomorrow, she said. I knew my brewing career was over. Uh, the next day, I sweated new pipes in the water lines and tested the system and found I needed three new stems and an aerator for the faucet. We also decided to completely disassemble the gas lines to stub out and rebuild the gas system. So uh, after after all of that, he uh, he got things to work, uh, and he says uh, from talking to the professionals, there are two main points that I took away. If you ever smell gas, even a hint of gas, call the gas company immediately. And if you run your own black pipe gas lines, always call a plumber to have the system pressure tested. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Boy, yeah, working with a working with natural gas, you don't want to mess with that stuff for sure. No. Uh, yeah, we had a, we had a big fire here, a big gas line fire in Farmington. That's right. They uh, somebody ran off the road and hit this big uh, high pressure gas line thing, and uh, 
and there was no no guard around it, and mm-hmm. and the poor person that ran over the thing perished in the uh, in the resulting uh, flame. That yeah. uh, was horrible. But now they've got a big. <laughs> they rebuilt that high pressure gas thing, and now they've got a big guard around it. Uh, mm. So anyway, yeah, it's a uh, it's scary stuff. Uh, this comes from Jim. Uh, the other day I was thinking to myself, too bad I've never had any brewing disasters worthy of your annual brewing disaster show. Careful what you wish for. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, this past weekend I had some time to myself while my kids were napping and the wife was out of the house. Perfect time for a 15 minute IPA, I thought. Getting everything ready was a breeze. I had the water heating in the kettle outside, so I went inside to get a little crystal malt to fancy up this beer. I added my crystal malt to the grain bag. Well, let me back up, Jim says. I almost did. There was an opening in the grain bag, so half my grain ended up on the floor. I should have stopped right there and taken that oversight as a sign. Nope, simple mistake. Let's keep going. Got my grains in, got them out, and got up to a boil. Right before I was uh, about to add my DME, I realized I forgot to attach the dip tube to the inside of my brew kettle. Good thing I have those silicone barbecue gloves, I thought. Warning. Bad Mm -hmm. idea alert. Mm -hmm. I was able to reach in and just barely attach the dip tube, but a little bit of the hot wort managed to make its way into the glove, giving me a nicely burned hand. Yep. Well, my wife was nice enough to bring home some burn cream and wrap up my partially boiled hand. At this point, I was determined to finish brewing this beer. See there, there we, there we go. We get it. Even mm-hmm. through injury, these brewers keep brewing. I mean, I've already invested so much in this burn needs to be worth something, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Finally finished the brew session. Start to finish it was about four hours, longer than expected, but still quicker than my regular all-grain session. Much longer than I had anticipated, but I'm excited to try my illogical injury IPA. <laughs> Yeah, I guess those silicone gloves are good for, for holding heat in as well as uh, holding it out. Yeah, that's no kidding. Uh, but, yeah, the 15-minute uh, uh, pale ale is not supposed to take four hours and give you a burn. Um, Dave, no, I've got a burrito that will do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 15-minute 15 15 minute four-hour burrito. <laughs> takes you 15 minutes to eat it. Four <laughs> hours to digest it, and it gives you a burn. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, my tummy. Uh, <laughs> I was able to keep down dry toast today. I'm I'm excited. Uh, Dave from uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, writes, My brewing disaster happened almost a year ago. Late January in New England, we got our first big snowstorm of the year. What better to do on a snow day than brew an extract batch? And one day before, we had just installed a new stovetop with one 22,000 BTU burner. About 15 minutes into boiling my Pliny the Elder clone, my CO monitor started beeping. I turned off the boil, opened some windows, waited a bit, and tried again. Same result. I made the brave decision that my family's health is more important than my beers. <laughs> hmm. That's that's good. That's a good thing. Well, I, I admire that. <laughs> I shut everything down. As I had only put in half of the extract and the 90-minute hop edition, I put my kettle and remaining extract, which was in a Ziploc Mylar bag, out on my porch. Plan was to finish outside tomorrow. About 7 a.m. the next morning, I look outside and see about four pounds of liquid malt extract spilled all over my tile floor on a 20-degree morning. What what ensued were many four-letter words. Reinheitsgebot was not one of them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah signed Dave in, Dave in Rhode Island um, this uh, yeah Boy, the, the temperature seems to, to uh, there's hot, a theme here yeah hot and cold uh, yeah. seem to be a theme this year uh, this one this is a very familiar story for those who have listened to the podcast this comes from our good friend Carl Summerfield down in Nelson New Zealand uh, who recounts uh, the story of uh, of of him and me brewing the uh, uh, the cream ale uh, for the uh, for the March Fest brew when we were brewing in front of a whole bunch of folks uh, and we were up on the stage with uh, Chris Colby and Andy Sparks and uh, Tasty McDole and and John Palmer 
and so, you know, no pressure there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl says, uh, we already had to swap recipes because of the possibility of a stuck sparge. I initially wanted to do the uh, a rye wit, but, they, were, you know, we were kind of afraid of uh, getting a stuck sparge on that. So we so we're brewing a nice, trusty, tried and true cream ale recipe. All was well until James spotted the flaked maize. That doesn't look quite like the flaked maize I'm used to brewing with. He pointed out politely, and he was right. Flaked maize isn't brewed with so much down in this part of the world. In the flaked maize uh, we had ordered for this event, looked like a cross between corn grits and powdered corn flakes. It could not mm. in any way be described as flaked. Uh, We had no choice but to use it, so we went ahead and stirred the weird powder into the mash. The mash rest went well. The wort cleared up nicely and had a a delightful golden color. It smelled great. Eventually, our 60 minutes passed, and we grabbed the handle and lifted uh, lifted the grain out of the wort and set on top to drain. Instead of a nice rushing sound, there was an ominous drip, drip, drip sound. (laughs) Looking around the crowd, no one had noticed, so we waited a bit. The wort was running out, but very slowly. We let it drain for a bit and then started to add a little sparge water. The sparge water just sat on top and showed no interest in dropping down through the grain into the waiting wort below. People had definitely spotted that things weren't uh, quite working for us. (laughs) We added a little more sparge water. If you watch for long enough, it was definitely running through, but at this rate it would be several hours before we could finish sparging. Chris Colby came over. Great. Uh, another brewing brain to add into the mix, and brewing brains don't come much bigger than Chris Colby's. <laughs> he is from well. Texas, after all. <laughs> He's got to fill that head. Uh, That's right. <laughs> Chris said, hey, James, word on the street is you don't know how to brew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just what the kids are saying. <laughs> Carl says, in the end, we decided to test the word and see what gravity we had. If it was high enough, we could ditch the sparge step and just go with a lower volume. Uh, The refractometer showed that we had achieved a higher efficiency than we were expecting, so we were even able to add in a bit of water to bring our pre-boil volume up and still hit our numbers. The rest of the brew proceeded without a hitch. So thanks to that's all thanks to Carl's uh, resourcefulness and uh, familiar Mm -hmm. with uh, being familiar with the. uh, the grandfather brewing system that was quite quite the day and quite the trip uh and i understand that that beer turned out uh, really well uh jacob in cheyenne wyoming um says uh, my brewing disaster took place about two months ago i had a free weekend and decided to finally brew an imperial ipa that had been thinking about for a few weeks the brew day started as normal. I got my strike water heated up and all ready to use my brand new cooler mash tun. I get all my strike water in my cooler and I'm just ready to dough in and I realize that I completely forgot to put in my ball valve and false bottom. Mm. So I drain out all seven gallons of strike water into buckets and get to work installing my hardware. Coincidentally, I'd forgotten to add my water adjustment salts to the water the first time around, so I had a save there. I get my water adjusted and heat it back up and dough in, amazingly with no issues the second time. I mash for 60 minutes and get ready to drain out, and much to my surprise, my false bottom had fallen apart inside my mash. Oh, boy. I didn't have any heavy kitchen gloves, so in go my hands into the 154 degrees Fahrenheit mash and reconstruct my false bottom with much screaming and pain. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) That's hot. Yeah, that's hot. That's McDonald's coffee lawsuit hot. <laughs> <laughs> I finally sparge slash Vorloff to my boil kettle and take a gravity reading. Undershot my pre-boil gravity by 10 points. Whoops. Get my boil going, throw in my hops throughout, th- throughout and realize that I'd completely messed up my hops and used the wrong ones all over the place. Oh, well, smells good, so let's see what happens. My boil is up and I do my whirlpool. Time to chill. Get my plate chiller set up and realize I only have one hose that isn't frozen solid. The, the cold Wyoming fall had caught me off guard. See, again with the temperature. Mm-hmm. I hook my water in line and then rig a short section of poly tubing up to the water outpost and decide I'll fill up buckets and then empty them one by one. I start draining and cooling to my carboy but in the mayhem of finding a garden hose, I forgot to clean and sanitize my plate chiller. I had about a gallon 
in my carboy already and decided it wasn't worth the infection risk, so I dump it. Quite somber-sounding violins, he says. Mm -hmm. The massive amount of hops plugged my plate chiller in no less than 15 times. <laughs> And combined with the taking time to clean and sanitize my plate chiller, my hot wort had been sitting waiting to chill for about an hour. Let's hope I didn't burn off all those hop oils. Uh, I finally get my sad four gallons of beer into my carboy and get ready to aerate and pitch when I discover my black lab puppy had sniffed out and eaten the entire yeast cake from my 10-gallon lambic batch I had dumped in the back. Oh. Apparently, I'd left the gate open. There goes another half hour as I... Frantically search if Brett in massive amounts is bad for dogs <laughs> and lock. <laughs> oh, Lord. I bet that's not a common search on Google. No. And uh, lock no. him in the closed off area of the yard in anticipation for the ensuing gut flora imbalance and yeah. diarrhea I expected him to have. Again, ringing familiar with the uh, <laughs> with today's mm -hmm. situation. Uh, by the end of this, I had completely forgotten to aerate and pitch yeast, even after I had carried my carboy to the dark spot in the basement. I did not realize my, state, my mistake until two days later. So over lunch, I roam, run home and get my trusty six-and-a-half stopper and get to shaking. I had a meeting after lunch, so I was in a hurry, and in so much of a hurry, I had not only forgotten to sanitize my stopper, but also pushed it all the way into the carboy when shaking. I scrambled to find another stopper but had to head back to work. It seems like I'm forgetting something. Oh, yeah, I didn't pitch my rehydrated, rehydrated yeast that was sitting on the kitchen counter. <laughs> Finally, after work, I, I pitched my yeast and relaxed with a nice, cold, home-brewed rye saison. The, wow. Uh, after, after all that, he says, wouldn't you know, it, this is by far the best IPA I've ever brewed. <laughs> Amazing fruitiness from the Simcoe Summit Citra hops, <laughs> great head retention and delicious hoppy flavor and great body. So there, so uh, oh, he says the dog turned out fine, but I f fear has developed a taste for Belgian sours. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do dog need crop dusting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lord, I've never heard of a situation like that before. I mean, what else could go wrong? Oh, well. <laughs> no, don't ask. We're, we're still about halfway through the stack. <laughs> we, you were over. This, episode, the, this episode's brought to you by the National Association of Plastic Surgeons. <laughs> you were over at the house one time uh, when our dog was uh, in the backyard. And, of course, <clears throat> we we had just sat down on the back patio to uh, enjoy a beverage and, and uh, cook burgers or something. And, and of course, our little dog, uh, our shepherd mix dog, ran over into the corner of the yard and started uh, defecating, of course, in front of company. And, and uh, he had a, got a weird look on his face and, and kind of was looking at his rear end and, and came running over. And he had apparently eaten a, a large length of rope. Uh, do you remember oh. this? Uh no so, yes it, well I, mean, I, I I do but I don't I I just remember that there was this weird live animal pull toy <laughs> that we <laughs> our dog Tony had a crappy tassel uh, oh. sticking out of the back of him <laughs> yeah I love that band <laughs> crappy tassel yeah yeah I I, I I held the dog and and my wife Susan had the uh, she grabbed a paper towel and <laughs> it was kind of like flossing the dog <laughs> trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you don't remember that as vividly, vividly as uh, as I do. Well, there's been a lot of beer in my life since then. <laughs> uh, Eric says, my brewing disaster revolves around a saison. Not my favorite style, but some friends asked me to brew one for a group picnic. It was an extract brew, so the day went quickly and easily. Hit all my numbers. I was a little worried about fermentation since it was early spring, but a brew belt kept the fermentation temperature up. After a couple of weeks, it finished at 1018, respectable for an extract brew. I boiled a cup of water and added four ounces of corn sugar, sugar in it, uh, then into the uh, bottling bucket and racked the beer in. As I was putting the beer into bottles, I thought that using a couple of 64-ounce swing tops would make a nice presentation, so I filled a couple and went on about the bottling. After a couple of weeks, I sampled the brew with friends. A decent brew with good, not over-the-top carbonation. Friends loved it. Picnic day comes along. People loving the Saison along with a cream ale 
and pale ale. Friends grab the swing top bottles and take them from the tables. Pop the top and there's a beer geyser spraying Saison, Saison everywhere. Had to open the other one. That was a that was a one off, right? Second one did the same thing. Thankfully, no one has asked me to brew a Saison again. So we had this discussion on the show, you know, the, have you ever had the experience where the where 12 ounce bottles work perfectly fine, but uh, if you bottle in larger bottles, they they get over carbonated? Yeah, I have not. Um I you know, when I get a gusher, they all gush. <laughs> <laughs> You're consistent that way. I, yeah, it's consistent. No. <laughs> I, I've I've never really experienced that, but but I've heard many people talk about it. Um, boy, the only gusher I can really think of that I, that was just really dramatic was a, a mead I think that we opened one time of mine, and and that thing shot off like a moonshot. I think it's still <laughs> still circling around Uranus. Oh, this is a non sequitur, but uh, I forgot to mention that uh, that the brew holler folks have uh, agreed to uh, be our <laughs> prize sponsors uh, this year. I say it's a non sequitur because it, <laughs> I thought of it talking about them before you talked about Uranus, but uh, <laughs> uh, but the fine folks at Brew Holler have uh, have agreed to be our prize sponsor, and and uh, you and I both use uh, Brew Holler stuff. Yep. Uh, to carry around our carboys and I and, sell it at my store. Uh, there you go. And so we're we're big believers in the brew holler people and so uh they're they're sending some prizes uh, to send out to to folks and uh and uh if there's not enough of that we'll we'll throw in some uh, basic brewing gear as well. So m- much thanks to uh, as usual uh to the folks at Brew Holler. So uh look for those at your at your local homebrew shop. Uh, ben from Chicago, Illinois, says uh, on brew day while trying to transfer the wort from the kettle to the carboy, my friend and I accidentally dropped the hose into the mostly empty carboy. Ben says, I think it was my fault. I don't remember or want to remember. He tried to get it out with chopsticks. <laughs> well, but that didn't work. <laughs> I tried to was get it a it... sweet and sour hose. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> that would work if it was. <laughs> it's a good thing it didn't go kung pao. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but you know, if you drop six of them and you get egg roll. <laughs> <laughs> ben says, I tried to get it out by hooking it with a twist tie hook that was tied to a string, but that didn't work either. After much frustration and time, we ended up using both techniques and successfully removed the hose. I don't remember if this was also the same day our auto siphon wasn't working, so I had to use the suck the hose uh, technique. I gargled with vodka beforehand, beforehand, hoping that would keep my mouth clean of bacteria. Uh, Despite the disaster, it, a Midas touch cone, turned out great. So there you go. You know, when when you're... uh, Homebrewers are... are, uh, Ingenious, and uh, they uh, employ ingenuity to uh, uh, to to uh, to take care of situations. I don't know, but <laughs> well, I, mean, I just I just keep coming back to the thought that no matter how badly you brew this, this mean, meaning whatever it is you're doing, they almost always turn out pretty damn good. Yeah, almost. It's amazing. Almost all. <laughs> This one is from Colby. Uh, uh, I found your podcast in June of this year and managed to make it through the entirety of your archives by (laughs) mid-October. Holy smokes. Yeah. Aided by a cross-country drive twice in in one month. Wow. Yeah. As well as a a one-and-a-half-hour morning commute to work. Oh, and I also listen at double speed, which is totally doable since you and most of your guests speak very clearly and enunciate well. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is for you, Colby. That's how we normally sound. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, during my delve through the archive, I found myself laughing uncontrollably, uh, uncontrollably at some of the brewing disaster shows I've heard and with a smug sense of satisfaction that I've never had my own brewing disaster, I had a brewing disaster. There you go. I'll See, give... that's what it'll get you. 
<laughs> I'll give you the disaster that is my peach wheat and Pliny clone double brew day. The brew day. I had to burn through the last of my extracts since my wife agreed to let me purchase a grandfather when I was finished with all my extract beers. I decided to set up and do a double brew day to speed up this process. I should note that I was temporarily using my gas grill with a high-pressure propane hose to heat my boil kettle since my new house had a low-quality glass stove and I knew I was switching to the grandfather for my next brews. Beer one goes great. This is the base wheat beer that I will rack onto my frozen thawed peaches. Noticed a higher boil-off rate than usual and slightly darker wort than normal, but oh well, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. Beer 2 is a Pliny clone with a 90-minute hop schedule. In those extra 30 minutes of my 3.5 gallons of wort, boil down to 1.5 gallons and darken significantly. Oh well, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. I will just add more chilled water than normal to bring me back to 5 gallons, right? Mm. The sugars are in there, uh, still in there after all, except they weren't. Despite following a recipe to a T, my specific gravity, estimated at uh, 1091, read as 1034. Crap, he says. I decided to wow. fix the problem by adjusting my specific gravity with three additional pounds of dry malt extract directly into the primary. I later found out that as the malt syrup cools, even after boil, it may settle for a bit, and a gravity reading taken from the surface may underestimate the sugars. Whoops. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. Yeah, so if you're if you're doing a... A boil uh, with the extract, you got to make sure that stuff is all mixed up before you take your gravity reading. Yep. Uh, one week in primary. Pliny clone is rocking away, and I'm watching the gravity drop. Decide just to leave it. Wheat is ready to be transferred into secondary onto my peaches. After a few days of me forgetting to punch down the peach chunks, I, <laughs> I, I notice I notice some moldy type substance spreading on top of my floating peaches. Oh, well, I decided to let it continue and see what flavors I get. Into the keg, Colby says. Transfer both batches into my empty kegerator, set the carbonation to 30 pounds, and leave it to pressurize. I go to check my beers in a few days, and against all odds, the Pliny clone is absolutely delicious, albeit slightly undercarbonated. Perfect amount of bitterness and just the right amount of residual sweetness to make this double IPA almost sessionable. Hmm. The peach beer tasted like moldy fruit peach beer. <laughs> oh, well, it was not it was not good to say the least, but just tolerable enough that I, for some reason, decided not to dump it. That's dedication. Yeah, I had friends coming into town, and I wanted to have something on tap, good or bad. Uh, how good are those friends? I th I'd say. Uh, the night my friends get in, I went to pull a beer from the keg, and it trickled out with no force and no carbonation. I pulled the PRV and nothing, no hiss of CO2. I decided to check my CO2 tank, and despite the regular reading, a regulator reading 30 PSI with half a tank of CO2, there's no CO2 leaving the tank. I decided to turn my regulator up to 50 PSI to see why there's no gas coming out. Nothing. Then I noticed the tank fill gauge is bent. The pin is stuck on a piece of metal. After tapping the gauge, it drops to zero. Apparently, my CO2 level... Uh, level gauge broke during the move, and it was out of CO2. No problem. I'll go swamp, uh, swap tanks and keep going. While my wife showers up before dinner, my buzz buddies and I run to the local homebrew store to swap tanks so we could have some serving pressure after dinner. I attach the CO2 tank to the regulator, open the tank, and whoosh! Massive sound of air rushing through the lines, the sound of the kegs filling up, then a distinct pop followed by gushing hiss as the beer starts seeping out of the door of my kegerator and spreads through my entire living room. I forgot to turn the regulator back down from the 50-plus PSI before attaching the new tank, and upon opening the valves, I burst my new silicone tubing. By the time my brain caught up to what the hell was happening, there was four gallons of moldy peach beer spreading across my thankfully hardwood floors. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It took me, my wife, and two buddies 20 minutes and every towel I owned to sop up the mess, as well as 10 or so separate sessions of me mopping the floors to get my house to stop smelling like a crusty frat house. <laughs> yep. After all my worrying about whether I ruined my Pliny, it was my simple wheat beer that ended up being the problem child. Huh. 
He says, well, he says, I've since added a manifold to shut off each keg, and I take extra precaution to see what my pressure is before attaching any new lines. So, yeah, there's, uh, uh, carpeting around the kegerator is <laughs> probably not a good idea. It's problematic at best. <laughs> You had a, you've done some peach stuff, some peach beers and such. I have. I had one actually that uh, did – well, it didn't explode from a keg or anything, but as it was fermenting, it did the, the classic, you know, no blow-off tube and the whole damn thing blew up and it was all over the ceiling. <laughs> so that happened once. <laughs> but we did make – we were making mead at my house one time and we – uh, just sloshed some on the floor, and I think I had to mop the floor about forty times. Yeah, I think Gretchen was, could... Gretchen was out of town that day, wasn't she? Yeah. Oh, shh! Don't say anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was. Yeah. And we have new flooring now. Oh well, there you go. Well, not just from that, but <laughs> in an unrelated note. Yeah, in an unrelated note. <laughs> uh, Norm from uh, New Jersey says. Uh, this summer, I brewed an amber ale, and I was transferring to my bottling bucket. Uh, the, si- the siphon dipped a bit too low and got some yeast in the bottles. I mixed the beer well before bottling to ensure even sugar and yeast in each bottle, not wanting too much yeast to get into one and cause a bottle bomb. In our small condo, I let the bottles usually condition in an extra tub in our bathroom should I ever get a bottle bomb. Thankfully, I never have, and this was my 15th or 16th brew and trusted that. Oh, how trust and complacency can be easily thwarted. <laughs> That's right. This time I put about 20 of the bottles I brought home, I bottled at another location, in my newborn daughter's closet as it was sharing the space with some other homebrew equipment. I was at work one day when my wife texted me, just saying, Beer everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a text you want to get. Well, well maybe it is. I mean, you, if you're getting ready for a party. That's well, that's true. You know, it, you, you know, that, that's vacation. something you, if you go to the Great American Beer Festival, that's appropriate. Yeah. To beer, beer everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> that's right. However, a text from your wife yeah. at home, <laughs> maybe not so much. Uh, Norm says, uh, a bottle in my four-month-old's closet had exploded. As, as my wife described it, it was not a simple explosion or normal bottle bomb. But she thought a transformer exploded outside. Oh, God. Despite being in a closed box, folded top flaps, glass got into every corner of the closet, the bottle cap wasn't found until months later, and Ooh. clothes and a car seat were covered in delicious beer. Goodness gracious. Yeah. I'm, I'm mostly grateful for my wife's attitude about it all. She was at home on maternity leave and lovingly cleaned it all up while I was at work. And even better, she still lets me brew beer. Uh, <laughs> we're thankful the the baby wasn't in the room while it happened. I've now invested in a siphon clamp for my carboy. Uh, months later, no other bottles have exploded, only that one. Why couldn't it have been one in the th- uh, of the 30 others that were stored safely in a basement, away from people in clothes and other such objects, such as the life of a home brewer? Thanks, Norm. Yeah, well, I guess it sounds like it may, may, might have been a, just a little infection maybe in that one bottle. That can happen. Yeah. Actually, yeah. If all the rest of them were okay. I uh, had a conversation about that with a with a patron the other day at, at Steve's Brew Shop. <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this conversation brought to you by Steve's Brew Shop. <laughs> anyway, this guy came in and he was, you know, he had not bottle bombs, but he had all the beers are great, but I opened this one and it gushed. And then I opened a few more and they were great. And then I opened it and I gushed. And I I think that sometimes, you know, if you get a bottle or two that just didn't get sanitized right, that's what can happen. Yep. That's why I sanitize in the dishwasher usually, just to mm-hmm. put them all in there and no soap mm-hmm. and a hot, hot wash and heated drying cycle. Yep. Uh, Pat writes, this happened to my third ever batch of beer. So I use a fast ferment conical fermenter with a ball valve and a collection ball at the bottom of it. That's, you know, the conical fermenter, and then it, you, you open the valve, and the, ye- the yeast and trube drops out into that little collection ball underneath the valve. Pat says, one day I was about to keg my beer, so I closed the ball valve in preparation to remove the collection ball and put on the hose barb attachment. Somehow I got sidetracked and didn't get to it that night, leaving the ball valve closed, Pat says in all caps. 
Fast forward two days later, I'm ready to keg my Kolsch, started to unthread the collection ball, and noticed it was a lot tighter than normal. Mm. Stupid me didn't realize the yeast that had dropped down into the collection ball was still a little hungry, creating a high-pressure bomb of trube. I finally twisted the last thread off, and boom, trube explosion all over my basement. I had to call out to my wife for her to come see the mess I just made. <laughs> <laughs> Took a few hours to clean up. At least it smelled nice, Pat says. <laughs> see, I think that's where Pat and I would, would, would uh, you know, differ in our approaches. I don't know that I would have called out to my wife to, to show her what I had done. Yeah, I would have called out the handy maid and got, <laughs> got, got them in there quickly. <laughs> uh, Jason from Golden, Colorado. Uh, my story starts during a winter storm in Colorado a few years ago. I took a Friday off work for the important task of homebrewing. As my wife got ready to go to her job that morning, she questioned my use of a garden hose during the winter. Silly girl, he says. Uh, my usual setup required me to access water from an outside hose bib for brewing and cleaning water while I brewed in the driveway. I dismissed her concerns as she surely did not know what she was talking about. I had done this a million times and I figured if the water was running off and on during the day, the flow would keep anything from freezing up. A little foreshadowing there. Mm -hmm. The snow continued to pile up, and snowflakes landed in my boil kettle as I enjoyed a nice big homebrewed stout and savored my day off from work. My wife came home just as I was cleaning up and putting my equipment away. We planned to head down to the local pub for some dinner. She ran to the basement to grab some clothes from the washer when I heard yelling. <laughs> I, I peeked my head into the basement door when I heard her complaining her socks were wet. Uh-oh, I thought. I went down, and sure enough, the basement carpet was soaking wet. I could see a path of water from the corner of the basement about where the outdoor hose bib was. Mm. For some reason, my loving spouse was giving me a look of death. <laughs> <laughs> Jason says, of course, the valve had frozen and broken just inside the house and was streaming water into the house. Oh, I quickly turned off the main water supply and called a plumber friend of mine. He came over and made quick work of the leak besides an extra hole in the drywall that I now had to fix. While he was there, I used the opportunity to show him a spot in the garage where I thought a sink might go. He looked it over and said he could plumb one in. I'd been wanting uh, a huge stainless steel double sink for some time, but wasn't sure how to swing it. My wife happily agreed to the sink, so no more disasters of this type would occur. Several weeks later, I was the happy owner of a beautiful double stainless steel sink with a sprayer and room for soaking two kegels or more, plus a natural gas garage heater, so the pipes to the sink stay nice and toasty, plus a warm home brewer. The sink has actually become my favorite piece of equipment. Some disasters do have a happy ending. <laughs> he says, my wife is super and doesn't rub it in too much about my manly knowledge of old man winter. <clears throat> Yeah, if you can engineer a disaster into, uh, you know, an equipment upgrade, that's always good as well. Mm -hmm. Nick from Collegeville, Pennsylvania, writes, I was living in an apartment in Con Conshohoken, Pennsylvania. We'll, we'll say that's what that is. Just outside of Philadelphia when this story happened, the main speaker is me, what I said and what I was thinking. Okay, so I'm, I'm just picture me reading as Nick. Okay. Hey, Paul, want to come over and brew today? I just got a brand new 11-gallon pot. I want to try my first all-grain brew in a bag, a black IPA. Great. I'll see you later. Sure, bring some Dogfish 120 IPA. I love that stuff. <laughs> now, this is, the, this is the high-gravity, uh, uh, you know, Dogfish Head uh, IPA. Uh Okay, let's start heating the water. Paul, can you pour the water into the pot? Thanks. This 120 is great stuff. Paul, why is my foot wet? <laughs> Are you that drunk that you're missing the pot? What do you mean you're not pouring the water? Paul, there's a hole in the pot, a tiny pin-sized hole. Crap. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do, Paul. I already crushed the grain. Okay, let's think. Yeah, more 120 will help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Yeah. Okay, grains in two bags. One has all the specialty malts. Let's use that one. I have no idea how much grain is in the bag. No, Paul, I don't have a scale. That's what the homebrew store is for. Wait, I do have a scale in the bathroom. 
Crap, it won't register. It's too light. Okay, let's think some more. Yes, more 120, please. <laughs> okay, Paul, you get on the scale. We'll see how much you weigh, and then I'll give you the grains, and we'll see the difference. <laughs> Sweet. It worked. Six and a half pounds of grain. That's how you weigh the baby, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's get the old five-gallon pot and try to mash in that. Yes, Paul, I am aware the liquid is too high to put the lid on. Let's just turn on the flame on low to keep it warm. What's the temperature? 154. Okay, good. Okay, Paul, could you check that water? What? It's at 168? <laughs> How long has it been since we checked it last? An hour? Crap. Yes, Paul, I know that's too high. Drain it anyway. Let's start the boil. Knock at the door. Who could that be? I'll get it, Paul. Watch that boil and add the hops. Hello. Oh, hello, officer. How can I help you? <laughs> Oh, oh making boy. meth? What? No, we're not making meth on the patio. We're brewing beer. <laughs> sure, you can take a look. Yes, officer, we'll be careful, and sure, I'll save you a bottle. And yes, I'll be explaining home brewing to my neighbors. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, did you add the bittering hops? Crap. Yes, more 120, please. Six weeks later. Okay, Paul, let's try this thing. I'm sure it's going to be terrible. I can't believe it actually fermented. Wow, this is amazing. Yes, I agree. It's one of my best yet. Yes, Paul, I know. We are never going to be able to make it again. Oh, well, it'll make a good story someday. Cheers. So there you go. That's in... <laughs> Yeah, inform your neighbors that you're not making meth. That's if... right. <laughs> um, uh, it was like a teleplay. It... <laughs> it's a Mercury it's like a... Theater on the air. That's right. Or a Murphy Brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why, while I was uh, in my uh, in my half a, a delirium from being uh, nauseous last night, I, I streamed uh, old Cheers episodes on Netflix. Boy, that's why you're nauseous. Back. Yeah, well, that couldn't couldn't <laughs> help. Norm. <laughs> but Marky Post was on one of those episodes. Woohoo! Oh, uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Kevin from Chardon, Ohio. My brewing disaster was, of course, during my very first brew day ever. It's important not to be discouraged if that happens. Mm -hmm. In September of 2015, my wife and I went to a Chinese auction fundraiser. Have you heard of a Chinese auction fundraiser? <laughs> I'm not sure. No. I'm not sure what that's all about. a fire drill? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of running around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we went to an auction fundraiser, bid on, and won a beginning brewing equipment kit that included the usual fermenting and bottling buckets, hydrometer, bottle capper, beginner's brewing book, etc. It also came with a robust porter extract kit with steeping grains, yeast, and hops. All I needed to purchase was a four-gallon stainless steel brew pot. Uh, Kevin says, knowing absolutely nothing about brewing beer, I read the included book and set about brewing my first five-gallon batch of robust porter in October. I followed the instructions to a T and added all the necessary ingredients at each step in the process. Let me talk a bit about those ingredients. The kit included two cans of John Bull malt extract. Mind you that this is 2015, and I later found out that John Bull went out of business at least five to six years prior to this. <laughs> yeah. The yeast had not been refrigerated, and I had no idea what the date was or what brand. A bag of crushed steeping grains actually still smelled pretty good. A couple of ounces of hops. At that time, I just thought hops were supposed to be brown with a little aroma, right? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, Kevin says, what did I know at the time? I thought I was about to brew the best porter ever. Everything was going great as far as I knew. Wurt smelled like, wort should smell like stale molasses, right? <laughs> Oh, crap, this smell is propagating throughout the entire house. It will be just a matter of time before my wife lets me know how she feels about this smell. I love her dearly, but I'm secretly afraid of her. <laughs> really afraid. <laughs> sure enough, I was told how awful the smell was every few minutes. Unfortunately, for me, that is, there was no turning back now. I continued boiling the wort for the entire 60 minutes on our ceramic top electric stove. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Excited to move on to the next step of cooling my wort and get the smell to dissipate as quickly as possible, I prepared an ice bath in the kitchen sink. I then lifted and placed the pot in the sink. 
Right at that moment, I put the kettle in the sink. I heard a loud pop, not unlike a firecracker going off right behind me in the area of the stove. I quickly turned around and was witness to my glass stove top cracking in every direction out from the center of the large burner that the pot was previously sitting. Yep. It resembled a scene in a movie where the villain is standing on an ice-covered lake and is witnessing his future demise of drowning when that ice finally gives way. Only in my reality this fall day, I was the villain and I was the one about to drown. <laughs> Did I say that my wife was in the other room when this is happening and she heard the pop as well? Did I also say that I'm scared to death of this beautiful woman? <laughs> Hence you can sense my fear that I was about to die at the hands of my own wife as many a married home brewer has felt at one point in time. Standing there defeated and scared to death, my wife is mad as a hornet. All I could whimper out was, I'm sorry. Stove ruined and Thanksgiving, hosted at our house just a month away, we had to purchase a new stove. So far this new hobby was costing me a lot more than I bargained for, both from a financial and marital standpoint. Beer actually turned out drinkable, barely. I will forever remember this first beer I brewed as Crack Top Porter. <laughs> Once I looked at the guy that was making meth. <laughs> <laughs> Once I did my research and realized that the extract kit supplied by the kind person who donated the kit for the fundraiser was just getting rid of something that sat in their basement or garage for years. Mm. Yeah, be be kind if you're going to donate to. Uh, brewing ingredients, make sure they're good. Uh, you had a little experience with your glass top uh, stove. I did, uh, but uh, what was it? I I boiled some shrimp. I was making a shrimp stock, and the and it overboiled, and it and the water got underneath the gasket, I guess, and it just fried it out. And it was we had to replace it. Well, thank goodness that wasn't a brewing related disaster. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Aaron writes, uh, I had just read Brewing Better Beer by Gordon Strong and decided to try his method of chilling while recirculating the hot wort with a pump. I purchased a pump and the necessary silicon tubing, and after a successful mash and boil, I got the pump set up for recirculation, a hose out of the kettle's ball valve into the pump, and another hose going back into the kettle. After getting everything hooked up and starting the chill, I kicked on the pump. To my surprise, the end of the hose that was in the kettle shot out and started spraying boiling hot wort all over my kitchen and dining room. Oh, boy. <laughs> I turned off the pump as quickly as I could, but a gallon of volume had been pumped all over my walls and floors. Oh, Lord. Luckily, no one got burned by the flying liquid. I got some rags and managed to clean up the sticky mess with no lasting damage. My wife even helped out after having a good laugh at me. <laughs> I learned my lesson and now attach the hose to a copper coil that goes into the kettle alongside my chiller. This not only holds the hose in place, but it also pumps the wort alongside the chiller coil for a quicker chill. Additionally, pumping through this coil gets a great whirlpool going, collecting hot material and tube into a nice cone in the center of the kettle. Sweet. Anyway, that is the worst brew day I've had. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Appreciate that. Yeah. No one got hurt in that one. That's a good thing. Yeah. Mark from London, England uh, writes, A few months ago, I started a new job with a three-and-a-half-hour daily commute by train. Oh, my goodness. Jeez. I began listening to your radio podcasts, digging through the archives, and, and the time flew by. Uh, thankfully, I've finished uh, that job placement, but I still listen and even began watching the videos. I have to say the videos ruined it a bit, though. In my head, James looked like John Candy with a beard. <laughs> so, so apparently my voice, the voice alone, I sound like John Candy with a beard. Uh, <laughs> I can never, un I can never unsee that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I have to start calling you Uncle Buck. <laughs> that's buck uh, <laughs> yeah it's buck <laughs> uh, mark says uh, your podcasts it, it, you never never you know you can never unsee what what a radio personality looks like you know the, i remember the first time i ever saw casey Kasem, i was like that's not right that can't be <laughs> um 
Uh, Mark says, your podcast helped me reassure helped reassure me recently after I had a disaster, perhaps worthy of your end-of-the-year special. During my last brew, the pump that drives the boiled wort through my counterflow chiller broke. I had a date planned with my girlfriend that evening, so panicked and decided to just transfer the boiling hot wort to the fermenter, planning to chill it in a bath filled with cold water. With the lid snapped shut, I wanted to make sure the inside of the bucket was sanitized, so I thought I would shake it and get the hot wort to touch all the surfaces. It did touch all the surfaces, all the ones in my bathroom. <laughs> Shaking the wort caused some of the water in it to be very to very quickly evaporate, creating pressure that blew the lid off. With a stiff, if slightly scalded, British upper lip, I stuck the lid back on and dumped it in the cold bath before running out of the door for my date. When I returned, I found the plug was leaky, so the bath was empty. The wort was still hot, and my bathroom was still covered in wort. Although I admit, at 29 years of age, uh, it was wishful thinking to expect the magical cleaning fairy to have visited. <laughs> Five hours after the boil, I managed to finally pitch the yeast whilst thinking about all the flavors I, all the off flavors I could expect. Drinking it now, it's absolutely fine, except there are no hop aromatics, and it's a little too bitter. The no-chill method isn't too bad, after all, Mark says. Well, well it's a good thing that, uh, you know, he didn't didn't have a, a storage thing under his uh, bathtub. Yeah. All the, oh, yeah. <laughs> where all the water could go. Uh, Jordan from Avon, Indiana, says, I know I've missed the deadline for the annual Brewing Disaster Show. Oh, this this he sent this January 11th of last year, <laughs> or oh. this year. <laughs> it happens, you know. Well, yeah. Uh, I had to share this one. For Christmas, by, my buddy gave me a gift card to my local homebrew shop, so last Wednesday we brewed an oatmeal stout. We finished around 9.30, and having to be up at 3 a.m. for work, I decided to let my aluminum brew kettle soak overnight rather than scrub it. Well, overnight turned into five days, during which winter struck. The expanding ice bulged the bottom of my kettle, which, sitting upside down, kind of resembles R2-D2. <laughs> mm. mm. <laughs> well, there you go. So, on a sad note, we heard that Carrie Fisher left us today, so that's... Uh, I yeah. have, have to give a shout out to uh, to Carrie Fisher and all the all the people that that uh, have left us in 2016. Holy crap. It's uh it's a long list of people that are frightfully near our age. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um Yeah, I was very sad to hear about Carrie Fisher today. Yeah. Well, here's here's a a toast with uh, diluted uh, Gatorade to uh Carrie Fisher and Princess Leia. Mhm. Indeed. Mm. All right. Joe from North Carolina says, I mash in a cooler on my patio table and then run off my uh, to my kettle on my burner. The brew day was normal, just like any other day, until I finished the runoff and fired up the burner. Almost instantly, I was surrounded by hornets. Yeesh. <laughs> Apparently, they had had begun to make a hive under the table, and the sudden heat caused them to evacuate and investigate. Well, I think being being surrounded by hornets would cause me to evacuate as well, but... Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> again, with today's theme of the, <laughs> of the stomach bug. Uh, Joe says, I had no choice but to leave the area, leaving the wort on the fully open burner. I had no... Oh. Hor <laughs> <laughs> I had no hornet killer, so once it was on the verge of boiling over, I was forced to brave the bees and relocate my burner a safe distance away. Ooh, boy, that's dedication. No kidding. I suffered only two stings, and the rest of the day went on as planned. The experience did, however, influence me to finally use the five pounds of honey my wife picked up for me at the local farmer's market. I added all of it at the end of my boil, turning my IPA to a double honey IPA that I call Killer Bee. <laughs> well worth the stings, Joe says. And in my hand, I hold the final brew story. Final story. <laughs> oh, that's right. Harry from Townsville, Australia, writes, uh, 
It all started out well at 5 a.m. I was up and at it. Uh, the Braumeister had been filled the night before, grains cracked, hops weighed, and nothing much to do but flick a switch and wait for the water to heat and mash in. After a quick trip back upstairs and a cup of coffee, I could hear the Braumeister beeping at me to mash in. I did as it asked and inserted a, the malt pipe and grains, hit OK, and sat back smugly enjoying my coffee. Ninety minutes later, another beep was heard, and it was now time to lift the malt pipe as the mash-out step was now complete. I removed the hold-down bar and wing nut to lift the malt pipe out, and in my horror realized that I had forgotten to put the bottom screen in. I now had six kilograms, or 13 pounds, of malt floating in 23 liters, or six gallons of water, with no way of easily separating them. I thought quickly and decided the whole thing was too heavy to lift, so I could drain out the ball valve into a grain bag and bucket and separate the wort that way. I grabbed a piece of silicon hose and set about getting ready to enact my cunning plan. The first part went really well until the hose got a blockage without thinking hose got a blockage. Without thinking I put the hose up to my lips and blew as hard as I could to free the blockage. It worked a little too well, and I was greeted by a rush of 78 degrees Celsius or 172 degrees Fahrenheit uh, wort running back at me. This resulted in getting splashed from the waist down in scalding hot wort. It burned like hell. I bet it did. Yeah. In the pain, I leapt away from the Braumeister and knocked several plastic fermenters and associated stuff off the shelving units behind me. All I could think about was getting this burning wort off my skin, so I quickly stripped off from the waist down, kicking my shorts into the corner of the garage. Regaining composure, I turned off the ball valve and was now standing half-naked in a pool of grain and water. To my horror, I looked up to see my wife, her sister, and my mother-in-law standing at the doorway to the garage. <laughs> <laughs> at least the minister wasn't with you. <laughs> <laughs> they had all rushed out to see what the noise was in the garage. My sister-in-law asked if I was okay. My mother-in-law asked why I had no pants on. <laughs> and, well, my wife just pulled the door shut, shaking her head. <laughs> in there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> After a long, cool shower, some aloe vera cream, and a change of clothes, the brew day continued as planned. There we go. The boil went well, and the beer turned out as planned. At every family get-together slash barbecue, when I offer someone a homebrew, my sister-in-law is the first one to sing its praises. She smiles at me and winks and says, I know how it's made. <laughs> <laughs> well, pants off, I mean, hats off to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to Harry down in Townsville, Australia. That's... Uh, I think that's the is that the is that the first brew story that we've had with the with public nudity? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> we have ground broken here on the show. Well, and the other thing, we've also broken a record in this show of the most skin grafts. I think so. Of all our shows. Yeah, that's the most burning. Yeah. <laughs> smells like burn <laughs> tastes like burning. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I uh whew. Ah, I think uh, I think I'm going to have to go take a lie down. Take a lie down. Yes, boy, howdy. Well, uh, uh, th this was this was very enlightening. Yes, I've, I've I've learned many things not to do. <laughs> As usual, I appreciate your your participation in the uh, annual brewing. Uh, disaster show, Steve, and everybody who sent in uh, letters as well. Stay away from your wife, Steve. <laughs> I will. Yes, because she has the same thing you have. You don't want it, I tell you. No, I, would, I, I wouldn't. Well, I guess I would wish it on my worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> People say that, you know, that they wouldn't wish it on their worst enemy. I think it's a pretty good thing to wish on your worst enemy. <laughs> it's pretty damn bad. And uh, uh, Anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> On that happy note. On that happy note, I'm running on vapors. <laughs> I've got to be running on something in a minute. I've got the vapors. <laughs> you got <Ooh>. the dropsy. <laughs> All right, Steve. I can't All remember. Right, what do we say at the end of this thing? We uh, find us on uh, on all the social medias and buy our stuff and and yep. uh, everybody have a, a safe and happy 
a disaster-free 2017. We appreciate your your patronage and your support and your uh, listenership over the past year. And and uh, he, he, cheers, cheers to everybody. And thanks, Steve, for uh, for for being part of it all. And, and uh, continued good luck <coughs> with uh, Steve's Brew Shop. That's right. Thank you, James. And continued good luck with Basic Brewing. Happy brewing, everybody. Dolphin safe tuna and all that stuff. <laughs>